Uh, kia ora koutou, ngā mihi nui ki a koutou katoa. Um, my name is Moira Cloney. I work for the Mental Health Foundation of New Zealand as the Service Development Manager. So I lead our programs related to suicide prevention, um, youth wellbeing and some initiatives around LGBTIQ plus wellbeing. Thanks, Moira. My name's Rowan McMahon. I'm, uh, we're your facilitators for today's session. And um, we'd like to have a really nice, open uh, conversation, a really inclusive conversation. Um, it won't be a lecture, because uh, I'm certainly not clinically qualified in the field, but I do have lots of questions about mental health and uh, the online space. Um, we uh, have some thought prompters and some topics we'd like to cover, um, but it's also really important that we get your engagement and your questions and um, use some of your skills to make sure we have a, um, a good conversation about where uh, mental health is up to in New Zealand and how the online space is uh, either helping that or hurting that and what can be done to change uh, that status of things. Um, so thank you very much for making the time and we really appreciate it. Oh, and by the way, um, the Netui Voices, uh, if anyone is um, not sure about something that they want to get across, um, I am a person who's willing to um, uh, speak up on your behalf if you wish, and uh, there are others here as well, so don't forget hashtag Netui Voice if you wish, and if you are hashtagging this particular session, I think we're just using hashtag mental health. Yep, hashtag Netui and hashtag mental health. Kia ora. So many hashtags. Um, so obviously mental health is a broad and complex issue. Um, We'll talk about it here, it's being live streamed and there's some chat online. There's also some collaborative notes up on Google Docs which are linked from the program. So use those and I've also pre-populated them with some help options if you're looking for help for yourself or someone else. So I'm just going to do a bit of a broad frame of the issue and then open it up to discussion. Um, and to start with, I guess, when I'm talking about mental health, I'm not talking just about mental illness. So everyone has mental health, sometimes it's positive, sometimes it's a challenge. On the positive end, we describe the state of flourishing, where people experience overall mental well-being, meaning and purpose in their lives most of the time. Um, there's been lots of work done on positive psychology concepts, especially in recent years, around the idea of flourishing. And on the challenging side, mental health can include experiences of distress, hard emotional states like grief, stress and sadness. Um, diagnosable mental health problems like depression and anxiety, and at the most challenging end, behaviours including suicide. And I just want to acknowledge those, in the, you have, those of you in the room who have dealt with really difficult stuff. I don't, don't take for granted when I'm talking about these topics that um, there's, this affects all of us in different ways. There are many of you who will have maybe lost family members to suicide, maybe live with really difficult thoughts and feelings yourself. So I just wanted to acknowledge the people and experiences you bring with you and ask that we all respect each other's experiences. Um, so just framing the issue, I guess, as, as well, mental health is influenced by a range of things, um, personal factors like sleep, exercise, diet, thinking patterns, genetics, life experiences, by interpersonal relationships like family and community, um, cohesion, having people who care about you, um, high levels of social connection, and also by be really big structural stuff like poverty, inequality, colonisation and discrimination. Um, quite often we hear about the dangers of the internet for mental health. Um, there are lots of examples of how technology can be, can be bad for mental health. It can, I mean, on the um, sort of more minor side, just distraction, um, sometimes sort of social disconnection, things like cyberbullying and harmful sexual behaviour online, through to sort of contagion around behaviours like eating disorders, um, self-harm and suicidal behaviour. And on the more positive side, it can help mental health, obviously. Um, some examples would be increasing social connection. Someone in the last session I was in around sex on the net was talking about LGBTI young people finding community, for example. Um, making it easier to find information about help services, giving tools for self-help, tech-enabled services like the Sparks um, game that's based around cognitive behavioural therapy and Youthline's text counselling. Um, it's a bunch of kitten pictures online. Lots of positive things you can, that you can use technology for to improve mental health. So overall, the internet um, can enable and support bad stuff, but um, overall it's not a bad thing for mental health. There's heaps of potential to use it to make things better. Um, so how do we do that? Discuss. I guess I'm um, throwing it open to any questions that people have or in, um, anything you want to hear people talk more about. 
and we have Laura and Dylan available to uh, run mics. We would like to, people to use a mic if possible so that the stream audio can pick up your question or your comment. And if there are no questions or comments, it'll be the Moira and Rowan show, which will get boring really quickly, so do help us. Uh, hello. Um, yeah, I was in the UK relatively recently. I had depression, and rather than sending me to a real counsellor, they sent me to an, uh, like an e-behavioural therapy thing, which was uh, terrible, and I didn't do it, and I felt bad about it. And then I'd get a call on a, on a phone, which was distant, and the whole thing made it, made it all worse. So I think that's, a, that's a, just, just the experience of the danger of... Um, doing it wrong digitally. Could you tell us a little more about the E? Was it a tool or was it an app or was it a survey or...? It was a kind of uh, form that walked you through, but it was pitched at like a very low level and there wasn't much flexibility in terms of... Uh, it wasn't very interactive or useful and... Yeah, I wonder if that's that is what I what I needed, or it was just a person to talk to, you know. Yeah. Um, hello, my name is Leona, and I'm from Hooks Bay. I um, I'm with the Hooks Bay District Health Board's Consumer Council, which is a, a a new group that's formed in the last two years, and we've piloted across New Zealand. Um, so part of our work is um, advocating for the health consumer and um, it's been very successful and a lot of our feedback that's been coming back has actually been quite influential in terms of where the direction of where our, our health services and directions are going. One of my questions is, I live in Wairau, so we're a rural com community. So in terms of um, mental health and that, um, we have compounding issues. So I just want to raise them on this platform. Um, language barriers in terms of with uh, GPs coming into our community, we can't seem to sustain doctors um, long term. So we have a lot of locums in that coming through. Language barriers when a lot of the GPs in that um, are coming from overseas. And that's evident um, with myself even going into the hospital and things like that and how um, previously um, consultations have been done previously with long-standing doctors. Um, another part uh, additional to the language barrier is um, here at Internet New Zealand, the, the theme is uh, Internet is everybody's business. We come from a community that has rural divide, large chunks of divides in our um, surrounding communities. So we don't have access to Internet. And um, even though we're coming through with government and that in terms of RBI and things like that, we're still waiting. So even though they say we're going to get it, we're still waiting. And so there we have issues there. Um, additional to that, we have transport issues. So it becomes a little bit difficult when families cannot actually get to our urban wider region for support. Um, when we're looking at cost affordability into our communities, we have a lot of low income communities, high unemployment. So then we have issues there. Part of the transform and sustain that's coming through with the DHB is around health literacy and promotion. How do we get that out there? At the same time too, is putting that promotion out, does it just get chucked in the bin? Like newsletters, flyers, promos. That's another issue that we um, are trying to tackle. Um, but basically it's around disconnection in our rural communities. I'm a, um, yeah, I love advocating where technology is gonna come in because I see it as a, an important part in getting health literacy out to our families and things like that. And additional to that, um, we have high suicide rates in our Mahia region, and um, we've actually probably toppled up in that area. Whether it's families um, within the actual region um, in terms of suicide, but we have a lot of people coming back to Mahia, and a lot of those people don't even live in Mahia. So it seems to be a spot there that's highlighted concerns. But yeah, thank you for that. Kia ora. I actually had someone from Wairua just contact me the other day to um, ask about promoting our Common Ground website, um, which is information for parents, families and friends around um, mental health, so we just sent them a bunch of postcards. But interesting, that reality check around the um, digital disconnect, that not, you know, not everyone's going to have um, access to the internet to be able to get that resource. Kia ora. 
I was interested, to, uh, David Fitzpatrick, I'm a clinical psychologist, uh, very interested in your UK experience. I've spent uh, the last 10 years as a director of mental health in the NHS prior to coming to New Zealand. And you're quite right, um, we moved from two-year waiting lists for face-to-face -face therapy to the kind of thing you're describing, but one-week access. And the exciting thing and why I'm in New Zealand is um, a company called Medical, the guys are sitting on my left, uh, have designed an amazing New Zealand product, which is telemedicine for the mental health space, amongst others. And what I've been doing with them is recreating the therapy environment, so the face-to-face -face talking, the chat, the whiteboard, the interactive drawing, the sharing, a really interactive aspect. And when I get back home or back to the office tonight, um, I'll be contacting the NHS guys, and we're probably going to be exporting this product from New Zealand back to my old services. So good on you, New Zealand. The wonderful thing about rural areas, um, and the tech guys can speak more to this, is e-mental health um, along the lines we're talking can enable access to difficult to reach and hard to engage communities. I think often we talk about rural areas as hard to reach, but mental health clients, and I include myself in that group as much as a practitioner, but also a, a receiver of care, um, we're also difficult to engage people. And where those two intersect as difficult to reach and difficult to engage, um, e-mental health through to telemedicine or telehealth can really uh, achieve something there. But we have to up our game. Um, in physical medicine, we would never accept the kind of experience you're talking about. Uh, your surgeon, your dermatologist would be expecting high quality images, good information. Um, and that's what I'm proud to be associated with here with this New Zealand company, is the, the same standards that physical health are insisting in in telemedicine. Um, will be doing in, in mental health. Um, so great things, and New Zealand really is not on the edge of the world, but in the leading edge of technology in this space. So uh, good news, I think, there. Very cool. The other um, product I was thinking of while I was listening to you, to both of your experiences, was um, just to mention was the journal, which is on depression.org.nz. So that's, um, I mean, some people will have the same experience where it won't work for them, I'm sure, but it's um, going through a series of sort of lessons with um, John Kerr and the ex All Black. So it's not super interactive, but you, um, you hear John Kerr and sort of talking about his own experiences and um, psychologists kind of giving their perspective and you can learn things like problem-solving therapy on there. So, I mean, my concern is there's not a lot of in-person follow-up. You can just sign up for that for free and do as much of it as you want to and then it may or may not work. And, but um, it is there and it's free and I think it's, um, it's made a lot of difference for some people. Anyway, there's a question over here. Uh, not a question, more of a, a comment. So in response to like, well not in response, like to follow on like with access to support in rural communities, it's also very true in urban communities, there's not enough support. Um, in, in the community groups I'm involved in, for example, there's this huge gap between starting to look for support, and when you actually get support. To get support through the Wellington Health Boards, you have to be in a very, very bad space. And it feels like e-mental health is filling up this void because there's nothing else there. Yeah. So, and also to follow on with that, like, it's not that it's hard to get, like it might be hard to get people involved, but when people are looking, there's also no support for them to be involved as well. Well, I think perhaps one of the the challenges is that um, you know depression or, or any mental health um, uh, issue is incredibly common, which is you know that's why we're talking about it. But that also makes it really hard to um, to spot well actually who is at highest risk and how do we reach out to those people. And the health services, New Zealand is not unique um, amongst developed countries. They've all got the same problem that the health the cost of the health system are going up really dramatically. So to have a sort of systemic um, issue that affects you know depending on who you believe one in four, one in five. New Zealanders, that's an awfully large number. And then how do you make sure that you can actually, you'll always have a limited amount of resources. How can you reach out most effectively, both from the um, kind of from the, the formal health system and then also with NGO support and, um, you know, some of the online tools. It's a, it's a big challenge. Uh, kia ora koutou. Uh, tēnē te mihi, kia koe e hoa. 
uh, te whaia, uh, mihi nui, uh, te iwi o te motu. Um, yes, mental health affects Māori very rapidly as well. See, I come from another approach because I'm not, not only a IT person, I'm also a minister of religion. So I have a divine link. <laughs> so, you know, sometimes, you know, sometimes to the gentleman who's a psychologist, like I say to my daughter who's a forensic psychologist, sometimes you have to step outside the square. We have many departments on mental health for this, for this, for this, for this, for this, but it's the solution. And I'm saying the final example is done back in the 20s because I'm, I'm from Ratana and um, we had a prophet who was able to travel around the world and heal people, heal the people throughout the world with miracles through telegrams, through letters. So the ability for us to believe that there is a divine intervention, we have forgotten that. There is a place for everything. There is a place for doctors, for psychologists, but sometimes when it gets to the pack where it's actually affecting all of the community throughout New Zealand, through families, you know, sometimes we have to dig a little bit deeper and a bit of faith can go a long way. And I know this from, from where I stand, pikite ora, good health, is very important, but it is a divine thing. You know, I'm not worried about, you know, the problem. There is a solution. But sometimes, like I say, you have to go outside your safety precautions. And I'm a, I'm a true believer in divine healing because I see it all the time in my work. Nō reira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Thank you very much. And a comment or a question over here. Um, kia ora everyone, um, my name's Rob, I manage an online service called Any Questions through the National Library and it's staffed by um, librarians from right around New Zealand. Um, we deal with students via live text chat, they engage with us online. Um, we have about, we'll probably have about 9,000 chats this year on the service. A handful of those chats will be what we call crisis referral chats, where a student comes in um, and they'll be in a situation of crisis, either depression, suicide or some situation like that. And we have scripts that our librarians are trained to give to students, such directs them to crisis agencies or mostly youth line kind of situation. Um, but the problem is that the librarians just are so, the people who deal with it, we're not trained to deal with these situations. And the students are coming in because they trust us, because we've helped them with stuff in the past. But I'm not sure of the other, when we refer them, I mean, are there other agencies that we should refer them to? What's the best place to take them to? Those kind of things. Because they want, the students want to engage online. It's not talking to someone, it's text-based. Um, that's the medium they're comfortable in. So, yeah, just any ideas is really helpful for us. Yeah, other people might have ideas too, but um, just wanted to... It's good that you mentioned Youthline. I'm not sure if you um, are aware that they've just recently launched their online chat service. So that's potentially something you could directly refer to, you know, same medium. But also they um, just re uh, released some research last week that showed that um, the, the vast majority of young people who are coming to them for help are actually coming through text messaging rather than um, phone. Um, just makes sense, like you can text message with somebody uh, when your parents are in the next room and you don't want them to overhear, that kind of thing. So um, they have a free text counselling service that's a good one to be aware of. But maybe talk to them too, because I'm sure they'd be happy to provide training for um, your librarians. Um, can I just say, um, is that URL just the youthline dot? Is it .co.nz, I think? Yeah, is that just the same URL? We do refer them to that, that site. I'm just wondering if it's a separate part or anything, but it's just the main one. It's, it's linked from there, but it's just new. It's only been in the last couple of months. Okay, cool. Mm. Thank you. Well, just following on from that, um, a question. So, uh, you know, this is an online group of people uh, in the room today and probably watching the stream as well. So we use social media as a really interesting um, set of developments that have been happening in the last couple of years is the evolution of our social media tools to start offering um, more pathways and more assistance in some of these sorts of areas. And so I thought an interesting question for the group today would be what role do we think um, the uh, social media platforms should be providing to us in terms of, um, on the one hand, perhaps they should do nothing, they should just stay out of it, it's not their business. 
another, uh, right at the other um, end of the continuum. Perhaps they should be taking quite an intrusive role to try to actually, um, you know, reach out to, to folk who are at risk, who may not even know they're at risk or may not want to be helped. Um, so just a question, where do, where do we think that the um, social media platforms should play? I don't know if this is an answer or just a reflection, but I think that we have to be realistic about the wide range of audience that we're dealing with. And if someone's um, carrying a huge mental health burden, there will be a sort of native form of communication that they're more comfortable with. So if I think about some people who are an older category um, and have their own sense of mental health issues that might have been made redundant in their mid-60s or something, can't find more work, suddenly struggling with this um, sort of depression from change in lifestyle, for many of people in that age group, meeting in person is the most comfortable way for them to talk about a deeply personal issue. Whereas um, I have an 18-year-old at home and I remember recently that I suggested he talk to someone and he went, oh, that's a bit forward. You know, like talking, for him, texting or being on, on a social media platform is a more natural, without eye contact, way of sharing something personal. So I think if you're working in that age group, you have to be cognizant of those platforms are native to the way that they think, to the way that they talk and to the way that they communicate. And they're quite comfortable sharing deeply personal information with someone in that context. I maybe sit somewhere in between. There's certain conversations I'd expect to have in person that I wouldn't have um, in, in media. So I think it will depend on who you're dealing with and that actually maybe as we go through this sort of disruptive technology of, of new um, social media platforms and things coming to light, we have to, as service providers or in designing our services, think of all, all avenues as being ones that we need to cater for. Just a reflection on that, which was, um, I heard a neat story recently, an Australian author wrote, a, wrote about his experience of growing up with depression as a teenager, and one of the things his mother and him had come to was that he didn't really like to talk to her about his problems or what was going on, um, but he was happy to email. So she had sent him an email, just you know, just checking in, seeing, seeing if you're okay, and there was kind of no pressure to answer, but in that format, it was just, um, it was just easier for him to sort of open up and talk. So interesting. Example. We might come to you in just a second, sir. Um, the, uh, an interesting development that came out in late February this year was that Facebook has um, launched some um, suicide um, ideation um, workflows, if you like, and so they will now, for, for the first time, if certain language is used, they will actually um, either allow a friend who sees a particular Facebook comment to report something that they, they think may be suggestive of an issue. Um, and in certain cases, they will even intervene um, uh, of their own volition. Um, they actually do have real people doing some of the, um, the assessment of what exactly people are commenting on, because um, some of this stuff is really hard if you're looking at semantics of language, that type of thing. If I say, I'm feeling depressed today, I could be quoting the Smiths lyrics or any number of um, uh, you know, poems, or I could just be being sarcastic. Um, so to actually sort of look at a particular Facebook post and say that is suggestive that someone intends to harm themselves is a very challenging step to take. Um, but I do think it's um, uh, an important step that they've taken. And the main tool that they're actually suggesting people um, take in that instance is, if, is that they'll, they'll get a little message that says, it looks like you're kind of under the weather at the moment, you're not feeling too well. Would you like to talk to someone about it? And that will suggest that they talk to either one of their Facebook friends or um, a mental health professional and they'll prompt you with a list of um, the resources that are available to you in, those, in that case. So I think that's an interesting example of a, you know, obviously a really large social media platform that's making that type of um, initiative. Um, but what's also really interesting is that some people have criticised them for even doing that. Um, and I think it puts the social media companies in a really difficult position where, you know, we think it's okay for them to sell us Coca-Cola and muesli bars and cars and hamburgers, but we don't think it's so good for them to offer us any help. So it's more of a statement than a question, but I think it's an interesting development and we might want to comment on it. We'll come to this gentleman as well. Uh, I came in late, so you may have already covered this. My apologies if it's the case. Um, I'm 
we, the, the theme here is how can the internet help? Um, I'm also wondering from sort of personal observation, it's mainly sort of depression type issues, whether people that use the internet, whether they have a predisposition towards that sort of depression, um, and whether the use of the internet and computing, uh, I mean, some of the things that are recommended for depression are, you know, getting enough sleep, getting enough physical activity, getting outside, having sunshine, um, and having contact, whether it's, it's physical or, or whatever. And it seems to me that using the internet too much actually works against a lot of that. So perhaps some of the things we should be looking at might be harm minimization as well as using the positive aspects. And, and I wondered if you know, there was research or whether, whether this is all, whether this is accepted fact or whether it's just my kind of it. Does someone want to respond before I do mine? Yeah. I think they found that depression cuts across everything. It's not just if you use the internet, then you might have more likelihood of depression. It's everyone has it in some way. But if, you've, if you're more privileged, then you don't realise it's depression. So mine was, my mind was blown by that. Thanks. Um, I wanted to just, just describe in the three-sentence version of a TEDx Women talk I saw um, about a month ago. It was a woman from the US who had created a text... Um, texting to kids app. And did you see this too? And I think for the short version of it was it started off as petitions and later on getting free samples um, and things like that. She had a massive audience um, and was making lots of money. And she realised that people, kids, were responding to it. And I, I can't read out the responses she described without a massive trigger warning, but that the things that some kids were sending, um, they needed help. And she actually rejigged her whole business and is now focused around funding the equivalent of a youth line, but for SMS. And it was an amazing thing. And I'm just thinking my own experience. I used to run the horoscopes for telecom. So you just send your star sign in and you get it. And I just looked through the audit log and there are kids having conversations there that I can't describe here either. So we, we have this in New Zealand. We have all the NZ Idol voting logs. We'll have kids who need help in there and we're not capturing it. Just, uh, I mentioned Youthline's text service, and that, that is an SMS-based service, just to be clear. So that's like a free, you text 234 um, for free, and that's, that's actually their main method of contact. So there's way more kids that contact them through text message than, um, than by phone. So they're a bit world-leading in that way, actually, but the, that TED Talk is a fantastic one. Hi, I'm Octavia. Um, I work at the Office of the Privacy Commissioner and the point you raised about um, Facebook um, looking at whether you're profiling for mental health issues, I find kind of interesting from a privacy perspective because it really is like a balancing act between you know, intervening in enough time to help someone if they are a suicide risk, but at the same time, I guess, um, <laughs> allowing them to control their identity and maybe that's not what they intended with that communication and um, I'd be, I mean frankly this is a question, what are they um, reviewing? Are they reviewing your messages or are they reviewing your um, profile posts? Yeah. As I understand it they're um, reviewing your posts um, they're not reviewing any of the metadata. Um, some of you know uh, Vaughan Davis and I were, were looking f uh, for a little while with Facebook at, at what exactly from a big data perspective they may have um, because we have a view that unless you've looked you won't find and there may be indicators of risk there in for example a sudden change in someone's communication patterns. They always post during the day, suddenly they're posting in the middle of the night. Isn't that a bit weird? Um, we don't know but we think it would be interesting to find out. Um, I should give a shout out to Internet NZ because they actually funded Vaughan and I through the conference round uh, earlier this year to actually attend Facebook's Compassion Research Day over in California, um, which was really fascinating. There was a lot going on in this space, a lot of really engaged NGOs and um, very passionate people about this. There's no magic answer being found, um, but I do think we'll need more work. Um, and I think that the, the response we got from Facebook about that particular project was that they feel like their dance card is kind of full at the moment with the things that they're already doing in this space, which is 
which is a, a good response from my point of view. To, to, to be told no because we're not doing anything about it would have been a bad response, but to be told we can't do this right now because we're doing these other things is, is okay. Um, I think we'll need to see probably in maybe about 12 months' time, perhaps when there's a bit more water under the bridge, whether those initiatives have actually succeeded or not. Um, but I do think it's a very open debate about what role these big platforms play in either helping or not helping and, um, you know, should they look at metadata, for example? Um, Facebook's uh, response to us was that they really don't want to. You know, they just don't, they just think that that's, that goes into the territory that we don't want social media platforms to do. Um, so they actually are sort of suggesting that, you know, if the user base were to call for that type of thing, then they would look at it, but they, they regard, um, you know, the, the user's data is extremely private to the users and they really don't want to pry into it. And so they're kind of doing this because they feel they have to, but they won't do it more than they really feel that they should, so. Hi, um, I'll try to make sense. In response to your question, I think um, depression isolates people just regardless. And, it's, and it, I don't think people who use the internet have any particular disposition towards um, depression more than any other sector in society. Um, I'm really anxious for the future of the mental health services in New Zealand with the shift of um, having the delivery from using the social bonds model. And um, I kind of, I think the world to me seems like it's getting meaner. And the online sphere often is a really, really mean space. And I was just kind of thinking about how can we, just as individuals, be more intentional with our kindness and model kind behaviour both online and in our, in our real worlds. Um, and just regarding the kind of services that you were two talking about, sir, um, the, the app, was it an app that you used? Yeah, like or was it... Um, I know I, my experience of some of those services, I, this possibly sounds racist, but my, I had a reaction to the accents that were used um, for some of the talking apps, and I think I would have responded better to a New Zealand accent rather than an Australian or American accent. Um, so I just, and I wonder maybe with um, some of these, these apps, that if they're perhaps um, building some kaupapa, some tikanga into the way that they're delivered, which might be more, um, uh, Māori might find able to respond to them more easily. And just regarding your thing about access and not actually having the internet where you are, but remembering perhaps that there are apps that can be downloaded onto people's phones when they do have access, and then they can take them home with them where they don't. Well, um, I just wanted to add in, like, you're absolutely right there about things getting a lot meaner, um, and there was also um, talk around age concerns in those platforms. I just want to know where the Ministry of Education comes into this and what responsibility that they will take for our schools. When we're looking at a, um, I suppose when we're looking at meanness, I have two daughters, 19 and 20, and so as a mum, I've experienced a lot of cyberbullying and a lot of... Um, depressive times with my girls and I, um, I always felt that there should have been a responsibility coming back in with the school as opposed to a parent taking responsibility for their child's actions so that's my question there about the responsibility with MOE. Thank you. Um, I, I think we've, we've talked a little bit about several types of text-based um, sort of counselling services and um, I guess what I'd like to point out or, or ask a question about is that there are um, significant differences between uh, having a face-to-face -face conversation and having a text-based conversation, particularly when you're talking about things that aren't just depression but maybe paranoid behaviour or, or, um, or delusions or things like that. You may not be able to um, tell um, the symptoms of those types of behaviour if you're having a text-based conversation and uh, from my experience uh, there can sometimes be, um, it can, because it can be difficult to, to tell the state that someone's in uh, when you're having a text-based conversation, it can be um, difficult to respond appropriately and sometimes that can make 
things worse. So I suppose the question that I have is that, well, not so much a question, but um, I guess a statement that we can't replace everything with with text, even if that is increasingly uh, something that young people are comfortable communicating emotionally through. It's, um, it has significant drawbacks, just as it inherently in the form. Can I just say a quick thing, which is, is just that it probably goes both ways as well. I think there's times when you don't get very much out of a face-to-face -face conversation with somebody who doesn't open up. So, But I completely agree that it, it can't replace real conversations. Yeah, I suppose I'd agree. Um, there's a limit to text. Um, I work on the in the trust and safety team at Trade Me, um, and so you probably know that there are lots of message boards and other ways that people can comment. Um, and we kind of rely on our community to report those kind of um, messages that might be concerning or show that someone's in need of um, at least some, some attention for, for something. Um, obviously, like, none of us are actually experts in the area um, or f as fully equipped to respond to those kind of um, messages. Um, we do have a former crisis um, investigator person who will kind of make a, make a point of individually um, looking into those comments um, and then calling that person and saying, was it, was it just something that they were saying off, off the cuff or, or was it a serious issue? Um, there's, I guess there's that tricky ethical question of whether that's too far or if it's, it's a responsible precaution that a company that's hosting those kind of messages should take. Um, but um, if anyone does have suggestions on how there would be better ways to approach that kind of thing, or if, if anyone's had experience with that kind of thing, um, or yeah, would, would have any recommendations, um, I'm very eager to hear that. Thanks. Yep. Um, just one thing I've noticed. Um, it seems a lot of the conversation is going towards youth, and I want to make it clear that mental health isn't just for youth. And yeah, like. Youthline, Youthline is great, but there's also people older than youth that need help as well. And also another thing is that I wouldn't trust Facebook for its policies. Um, they might be like, oh, we won't track data because privacy things, but at the same time, they're enforcing real name policy, which is incredibly harmful for the community, and the community is against it, so. Uh, kia ora. <clears throat> Once again, I'll step from the opposite side. You see, with mental health, there are various stages. There is the paranormal side of it that some of us never get a chance to witness. And thank God I've had experience in this area as well. And I'm saying that um, because as a follower of the Ratana faith, we also have a page on Facebook. Now, when our people become sick, sick there's about 70,000 of us. And um, a lot of the guys call me this cyber apostle. But that's okay. I have no problems about that. But at the end of the day, it's trying to get to the core, the root of it. I'm not a medical doctor, but I understand the things that you don't see with the human eye. I've been around long enough, 35 years of going through this stuff. I'm actually older than what I look. And, and, and when you see the different type of sicknesses and illnesses, some of them that you guys will never understand, so you give it a title as mental health. There are other things, dynamics that are happening beyond the mind, and, and especially for Māori and the tikanga side of it. We some, see some of our people, you put them in an in a institute and you fill them up with drugs. That is not the way. When I was going through this thing, I went through this issue long ago, 35 years ago as a young kid. And so when our old people used to get us, when we were sick, they used to bring us into the house. They used to have a group of old people and they used to look at you at the symptoms. They would ask you questions or the people that brought you in and try to diagnose you spiritually. And of course, we had a medical doctor on hand. And so I'm saying that it's more than putting money into all these institutes. There are two sides to it. There is a spiritual side and there's a physical side. 
If you're too spiritual, you blow up. Or shall I say, if you're too spiritual, you burn up. If you're too physical, you blow up. But if you bring them together, you'll grow up. And this is the balance and the fine line between sanity and insanity. And that's why I say that, um, that there, are other, there are other dynamics happening outside the mental health. And, and it's not about putting thousands and thousands and thousands of dollars to try and find the magic pill. I think it's dressed right across the board, and you cannot only look at it from a clinical point of view. You have to also look at it from a spiritual point of view. And I say for us as Routon the Followers, we have our web page online on Facebook. If someone's sick or suffers from mental health, we all become part of it as not only prayer soldiers, but bring in our best people who have the so-called ticket to operate either in the medical field, in the psychology field, or in the paranormal field. Noreira, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Okay, thank you. Wait for the cameraman. Um, response to the very good observation on uh, text messaging and then governance issues, which is real concern. Um, I think we need to be very cautious in our rush for accessibility that we stop doing evidence-based interventions. Again, within the physical environment, a surgeon will only adapt to his environment as far as is ethically and clinically appropriate. Just because we're in the mental health field, I don't think that should allow us to adapt to any environment and stop evidence-based work um, that has been proved scientifically um, through randomised control studies to work. I think we need to hold mental health professionals to the same standards as physical professionals, and there is a step too far in terms of accessibility, hence the obligation to find technological ways that are evidence-based, appropriate and accessible. I think quality and accessibility go together. Um, big concern of mine is exactly the point you've raised around governance. When I see someone face to face, um, my professional body requires incredible uh, legislation around confidentiality, how I treat patient records, etc. Um, with Obamacare in the States, the HRPPAA, HIPAA requirements um, have upped the entire game, and yet too frequently I see professionals, um, and by professionals I mean people registered with professional bodies practicing evidence-based uh, mental health. Um, they go online and they'll be using Skype or some other form of chat, uh, unsecured emails. What happened to all the governance issues around face-to-face? -face? They don't just go out of the window when suddenly you're online. And so I would like to challenge um, fellow professionals and people who work in this area that as you move out of the face-to-face -face consult consulting area and you go online, your standards around governance probably need to be higher, um, but certainly not lower. Um, so I think there's there are two areas of concern, just to summarize, that in the strive to be accessible, we stop doing evidence-based work and Again, in the strive to be accessible, we throw governance, confidentiality, and data security, and patient confidentiality out of the window. Um, certainly, I know if you asked which of my files I would not want too well distributed, my physical file or my mental health file, I know which one I would want the higher standards to. Thank you. Just before we come to you, uh, just a quick comment. So the, um, and the lady I didn't catch your name from the Privacy Commission might be able to help us with this. There is a, um, a large scale project around creating an e-health record for New Zealanders. That's been going for some time. And I remember at NetHui last year, for example, there were some really thorny questions being thrown around about exactly what the privacy standards should be for that. Um, it's also interesting to consider what privacy standards apply to the physical record that the e-health record may be replacing because well, I'm not doubting what you say about the, um, the standards that uh, clinicians hold themselves up to. Um, if it is a paper-based record, it's you know, presumably stored in a filing cabinet somewhere and there's a, we, hope we, we hope they keep it locked and we hope it, and there's never a break-in and so on, but there are you know, potentially challenges around that space as well. So I don't, don't know if you can comment or...
Hello. Yep. <laughs> so, essentially, um, I agree with your comment in regards to the standards of confidentiality that apply to um, health records in the technological space. And so what's happening at the moment is we're doing a review of the Health Information Privacy Code to adapt to these advances in technology. Um, you know, I don't see the standards changing in respect to um, data security changing. Like, yeah, it's, it's more um, framing it in a way where people understand what the process is um, online. Um, sorry, just need a recap on your other question. <laughs> Yeah. Hi, I'm, I'm Sarah. I'm also from the Office of the Privacy Commissioner. In terms of the report, the e-shared health, um, health records, we did publish a report a little bit earlier this year. And so in Wellington, there's now a shared health record, e-record system set up amongst a number of agencies. I'm not sure exactly how many. I will find a link to that end. Okay. My knowledge of shared care records is... Um, I mean, we've got an expert in the office who does health information privacy. Um, but I know, for example, there's a group of DHBs in the Lower North Island who have shared care records. Um, but how widespread that practice is, I mean, it's an emerging area. Yeah. Hey, it's Martin here. I can speak to the paper records. Um, my GP that I normally use, uh, their practice building was destroyed by a fire about two months ago. And I had occasion to go and get a flu shot, so I spoke with the receptionist. And yes, they still have my records from 1969 because they were kept in a fireproof safe room and they're required to do so. Uh, does anybody want to carry... I was going to talk about something quite different. So if somebody wants to carry on about with that conversation... Evidence-based practice, if that's all right, just um, briefly, um, which was to say that it's a balance, isn't it, because evidence hasn't really kept up with technology. So um, an example of a good evidence-based intervention would be Sparks, um, sparx.org.nz, is an online game that um, incorporates the principles of cognitive behavioural therapy, and that was found in randomised control trial to be um, as good, if not slightly better than treatment as usual for young people. So... Um, so that's been made available for free, but it, was, it had to go through quite a process. So it was maybe 10 years ago that it was developed by the University of Auckland researchers, and it's now available online for free, and they're thinking about working with it to get it to work on cell phones. <laughs> um, so that's fantastic, but um, in some ways I think we need to be able to work with kind of evidence-informed principles rather than maybe having to wait for randomised control trials to be able to keep up with what the possibilities are. Anyway, that was all I wanted to say. Um, so this goes back to um, it not just being about youth um, and in terms of including our elderly um, and how we, I mean, society treats them bad enough already as it is. And I had a very, very dear aunt, elderly aunt in Christchurch, who following the earthquakes, um, she came from a generation in school of thought that didn't believe in depression. And it was really sad for me to see her because she got depressed, but she was really hard to help because, you know, you pull your bootstraps up. And, um, but we got her online. Um, she was still really lively in her mind and really curious and inquisitive. And getting her onto the internet was awesome because she could, she was physically quite um, immobile, but she was able to engage with the world in a curious way using that. And as a family, we were able, we were able to Skype her um, so that face-to-face -face visual experience was really good for her and it was nice to be able to take advantage of those tools. Uh, yes, that's all, I think. Um, this is just a question in case someone knows the answer about whether there are tools available in which someone can help their future self um, when they're in good health, that they can set things up, perhaps on their cell phone or on their computer, that when bad time comes, I can say I'm gonna get an answer from over there. Uh, as an example, I have a bad back. I've loaded an app on my computer which says every hour you've gotta go and take two minutes break and it doesn't allow me to do anything on the computer for two minutes. I've gotta go stand up and walk around. Where, 
And I believe that there is evidence base that shows that, for instance, looking at a, an electronic screen bef shortly before you are due to go to sleep does actually make it harder to go to sleep. And whether, well, I first of all like to know whether that's actually confirmed as true. But I can certainly see that um, because the internet is such an open thing, that it is not a self-limiting. A book is self-limiting. You get to the end of it, or it gets too heavy, and you put it down. The internet, you can keep on going forever. You can keep awake forever, and that does not help mental health. So I'm interested to know if there are tools that someone could help their future self by setting limits so that when it is one o'clock in the morning, and they're on a roll, and they want to keep going because they're energized, that they can sort of help themselves. Yep. One thing that comes straight to mind is a service that lets you send emails to yourself in the future. Another one is, yeah, you can set limits to how long you can browse the internet, dim your lights, all those things. I'm sure there's others. Waiting for the... Yeah, there we go. Um, you made the good point about um, looking at computer screens late at night. Can't, you know, there is evidence that it can make it a little bit harder to, to um, sleep. Mostly, mostly the evidence around that points towards, you know, the blue light. You know, I'm, I'm from, uh, from the screens, something triggers that it's daytime. There's um there's a piece of software at least on Mac called Flux, which you set the times, and as it as it gets later, it pulls the screen from blue down through amber down to orange, so that it limits the amount of blue light that's coming through. Now, now that doesn't help you go to bed earlier. <laughs> it just, you know, but it is something that, that tries, tries to make it not, not quite as abrupt on the system. And certainly when I notice that I'm looking at an orange screen, I close the lid, go to bed. Is that the same? Um, oh, cool, great. A great friend of mine has a really low tech option, which is setting an alarm half an hour before she wants to go to bed each night. So she's set that up for herself, it's a routine. Sorry, it's me again. Look, you know, common sense prevails. See, I'm a strong believer. I believe in self-discipline. And I believe that every one of you in here are adults and are old enough to know your own body, your own mind. There are times that we need to mature spiritually and physically. And I, I kind of practice this every day as part of my ritual that I make sure I give a full check. Like my computer's inside me, although I carry one of these around every day. But I'm a true believer that we have all the answers in ourselves. It depends on what stage of life you are at. When you can mature yourself, different to the critics from, from the medical world, but you know, there are things that are far greater than you and I. And so I'm saying that, that if you self-discipline yourself, because you can be a rubble for other people. I've seen it over the years and years where, where you be positive around people who are, you know, are not so confident and suffer some form of, 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 of mental state or mental health, whatever you want to call it. And it's actually empowered them to look at themselves. So I'm saying, you know, don't read all books. You have the answers inside yourself as ordinary people, what you were referring to. So yeah, kia ora. Now, Mihi, thank you very much. I'd just like to say I'm very pleased we got the TUI. Um, I thought we weren't going to get the TUI, but that's fantastic. I think that means we're almost out of time, but just have a couple more minutes, is that right? We're bang on, are we? Okay, um, Maura, would you like to say any closing words? Or? Well, thank you very much. It's been a really helpful session. I'm sorry we probably haven't had quite enough time to go through a number of the really interesting topics we've started, but please keep the uh, conversation going, and um, I hope you enjoy the rest of Nehui. Thank you. Uh, a thing to say is that on the accessibility tip, I brought some pieces of paper resources there on the table at the back if you want to take anything away with you. <laughs>